and take it away. Okay, great. Thank you, Joey. Uh, so, uh, colleagues, if you'll just bear with me while I uh, share the screen, and then I'll um, I'll just check uh, with my lost people's colleagues that it's showing okay. Okie doke. So, could I just check? Because um, I, I can't see anything now other than other than the talk on the screen. Uh, Joey or Rich, can I just check that showing okay? Yeah, it seems fine, Pete. Great. Okay. Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank, thanks very much to colleagues um, in the Lost Peatlands Project for inviting us to talk uh, today. And uh, my name is Pete Jones. I'm lead specialist advisor uh, covering peatland ecosystems for Natural Resources Wales. And uh, believe it or not, I've been um, around in the peatland world for about 26 years now. Uh, so I was appointed as what was then CCW's first uh, peatland uh, kind of specialist. And um, I've been involved in getting all sorts of projects uh, off the ground, including a couple of life projects. And then most recently, I've uh, I started off our national peatlands action program which now has a, a team of six people uh working on it which is fantastic and along with um joey and uh, richie and colleagues in south wales and several current peatland life projects and lots of other partner activity uh, there's probably more people working now to try and um, restore our, our peatland resource in Wales than at any time uh, previously. So perhaps that's a good time really to give a bit of an introduction to, to Welsh peatlands. Um, so what I was going to do, um, if that's okay, is uh, first of all, introduce you to peat and peatland ecosystems. It's a good, good place to start really. Then talk a little bit about where peat occurs in Wales. Uh, talk a little bit then about the character and habitat cover of our peatland resource in relation to the main kind of environmental influences. And then uh, finish off before handing back to Joey really with um, a bit of a chat about the challenges and the new opportunities in achieving the protection of our of our peatland resource. So uh, Joey, can I just, just double check you can hear me and see you're seeing this okay? Yeah, yeah, all fine. Great, fab, okay. Great. Uh, so that's uh, that's what I'm going to talk about for the next uh, 50 minutes or so. And as Joey said, uh, do do please, um, you know, uh, pose uh, questions in the chat. Um, it's a bit difficult for me to answer them during the course of the talk. So if it's OK, we'll uh, we'll save them up until the end. OK, so uh, what is peat? And uh, this is a particularly spectacular cross section through a, a blanket peat profile in mid Wales shortly after um, a forestry road was constructed. And in essence, peat is the is the dead and generally only partially decomposed remains of plants that have accumulated in situ under waterlogged conditions. So this is this is quite an old definition. Now this goes right back to the Ramsar. Uh, convention which was signed in Iran in 1971 and which was really the first um, global mechanism that led to the protection of um, wetlands uh, including including um, peatlands and the reason um, peat forms in the first place is that oxygen diffusion in water is around about 10,000 times slower than in air and in a waterlogged soil profile it doesn't take very long for all the the, the decomposer bugs that are, that are normally in the soil to exhaust the oxygen supply. And so layers of peat begin to uh, begin to slowly build up. And, um, uh, you know, typically peat in a, in a sample from a peat core looks like this. So it will have a kind of cheesy, squidgy consistency. Quite often plant remains are, are, are very um, visible, although not always um, so. Uh, but critically, there'll be an absence of clay or silt or, or sand, any significant proportion of those in, in, in the profile. And kind of once you've handled a few peat samples, there's kind of no mistaking it. And over time, uh, really quite significant thicknesses of peat can build up. And there's a kind of general northern, northern hemisphere accumulation rate of around about a millimetre per year. So it takes around about a thousand years for a meter of peat to accumulate. And this particular picture is a is a cross section through a cutover 
um, peatland in Estonia with the guy on the on the ladder. If we assume he's about you know 1.8 ish meters high, that's easily five or six meters deep. And in fact, in Wales, we get we get peat deposits certainly up to 10 meters thick, uh, maybe as much even as 13 or so meters. And globally, they can go a lot deeper than that. And of course, in the in the tropics where um, there has the, the ice age had much less influence. We've got um, multi tens of meters peak profiles that, that the base of which can be as old as about 48,000 years old. So these are really quite extraordinary, um, you know, um, you know, quite extraordinary deposits. Um, in um, in Wales, we now base our definition of peat soils on the soil survey of England and Wales definition, which is defined as uh, more than 40 centimetres of organic material within the upper 0.8 metres of the profile or where you've got about a third of a metre of organ organic material resting directly on bedrock. And um, <clears throat> beg your pardon, based on this definition, uh, the latest peat map of Wales, which which actually dates um, just from earlier this year in this report here, um, is of the order of just over 82,000 uh, hectares. And because uh, peat is composed of the largely undecomposed remains of plants, uh, it's got an awful lot of carbon in it. And uh, despite the fact that, that peat soils really only cover about 4% of the Welsh land area, they've got getting on for 40% of the soil carbon. So these are the most concentrated terrestrial ecosystem stores of carbon, really, which is one of the reasons why uh, so many, so many, um, you know, people are now engaged in their in their conservation. And I'll I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And and this um this map and all the peat mapping resources are now available on. Uh, the Welsh Peatlands data portal, which you can get off uh, the NRW website. If you just type in uh, Welsh Peatlands data portal into Google, it'll it'll get you there. If there's any um, trouble getting it, do 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 let me know. Okay, well, in terms of the um, extent of peat in Wales, as I say, it's around about 80, 82,000 or so hectares, and it's pretty widely distributed. It's most concentrated along the upland spine of Wales. Um, so going from the Lost Peatlands area here um, in Neath Port Talbot and uh, Ronda Cun and Taff, all the way north right up to the Carnevi, uh, not far from where I'm speaking to you from, I'm on Anglesey today, um, and the Carnevi, uh, we've got peat there up to about 850 metres uh, elevation. And then either side of this upland spine are all these little dotted sort of deposits of peat, primarily as lowland peatland deposits. Uh, so really, wherever you are in the country, you're not going to be terribly far away um, from an interesting, interesting peatland uh, environment. And one of the uh, significant things really about the Welsh peatland resource is that we've got quite a lot of peat within an equivalent latitudinal zone in England where there isn't all that much and there certainly isn't very much upland peat. Um, so that's one of the things that makes uh, Wales kind of quite biogeographically significant. Obviously the amount of peat we've got is dwarfed by the Scottish resource which is you know weighing in at well over a million um, hectares but really with the exception of the um, peatland habitats in the very far north of Scotland, Wales is a microcosm of the UK's peatland resource as a whole, at least ecologically. Okay, so on to some uh, definitions. And I've got to admit um, straight away here that um, peatland people are notoriously nerdy with their uh, definitions. And there's lots of different classification schemes out there. And it causes a not insignificant amount of completely um, understandable confusion. But in essence, um, a peatland is an ecosystem based on peat. There is no minimum depth of peat globally that's regarded as, as, as being commensurate with a peatland. And significantly, the Ramsar definition, which is the one we use, uh, uh, classes a peatland, even if the stuff on top of the peatland is no longer peat forming. So uh, a, a peat deposit under intensive grassland or a peat deposit under planted conifers is still regarded as uh, a peatland. And I think that's quite an important concept when thinking about the long term future of these of these ecosystems. Um, you may also have heard of the term Maya, 
and a lot of people use mire and peatland synonymously but in fact a, a mire is any perennially wet soil-based terrestrial wetland so it does include certain types of non-peat forming wetland uh, such as some of the really very calcium rich uh, fens which we get dotted around Wales which are uh, essentially forming marl or um, un otherwise um, uh, calcareous rich uh, deposits and then within the concept of peatland there are two broad uh, units there are bogs which are the uh, rain fed peatlands these are the ones that are getting almost all of their um, water and solutes from atmospheric precipitation and that would include a majority of the of the blanket bog in the lost peatlands area and then there are uh, fens which are uh, can include peatlands and non peat based mires which are fed not only by rainfall but by other sources of water as well critically uh, groundwater or surface runoff so it's a, this is just a you know simple conceptualization really just to get us going with the with the terminology okay well um, just thinking a little bit more about the the habitat cover of welsh peatlands and this is quite a useful little figure that um summarizes the extent to which our peatlands of wales have been modified and it, it's only the ones marked in purple here that still have uh, an, an existing peatland vegetation cover uh, with all the rest of it is uh, sitting under more modified land cover types which include forestry which of course is an awful lot in the lost peatlands area or indeed improved um, grassland as on many of our uh, bigger west facing um, valleys and the little inset picture on the right just shows just how much semi-natural and improved grass than there is um, sitting on deep peat. Most of it, um, because it's pretty uh, modified, um, is steadily oozing uh, greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, of which more, of which more in a minute. Okay, so if we just zoom in on our semi-natural peatland resource, what what are the kind of driving gradients that are responsible for the different types of, of peatland that we have and in in broad terms we can we can separate all, all our peatlands uh, our semi-natural peatland ecosystems based on two main gradients the first relates to the, the kind of acidity or alkalinity of the soil and that's on the bottom axis and then the vertical axis is based on fertility in terms of the availability of uh, plant macronutrients so at, at the bottom um, are in the bottom left hand corner in fact are our bogs very low ph by and large very low fertility and then we get we move into the kind of world of fens initially our acid or poor fens as they're often called uh, which occupy quite a wide ph range but are still pretty infertile and then uh, moving further to the right are calcareous rich fens which go right up to the high eights in terms of ph and you know bear in mind ph is a logarithmic scale so um, a one unit difference is a tenfold difference in acidity alkalinity and then going um, up the fertility gradient we have most of our swamp ecosystems and then the tall herb fens and then the kind of super nutrient rich uh, fens and these codes here are from the uh, uk national vegetation classification but an awful lot of the conservation the nature conservation interest is focused in this lower fertility end of the uh, spectrum which is why uh, Maya uh, or peatland conservationists often uh, obsess a bit really about nutrient um, enrichment of course there are other critical gradients at play uh, hydrology has a huge bearing uh, very often as the driver for whether something is um, acid as opposed to alkaline um, how old the peatland surface is uh, and of course altitude uh, and we go all the way as I, as I said at the beginning actually from naught to about 950 meters are our highest um, uh, uh, spring water fed uh, fens in Wales okay well I'm now going to move on to the, to the main kind of Welsh peatland ecosystems and um, dominating the lot really is uh, blanket bog uh, these are um, rain fed or acid peatlands that develop 
um, to an extent decoupled from the underlying topography because their formation is is driven by this excess of rainfall over evaporation. And an awful lot of the resource is upland, but there are quite a few lowland sites dotted around um, as well. And in fact, we think we may have lost very many lowland sites to historical um, peak cutting. Um, within Wales are some of our most southerly UK examples, and really with the exception of Exmoor and Dartmoor, the Lost Peatlands area captures that part of the resource. And I remember when the original bid for Lost Peatlands was put together, that was one of the uh, points we emphasised in it, that these were right at the very extreme kind of geographical range of this habitat in, in the UK, and, a, a, and at a corner of the distribution, which is likely to get quite stressed really as climate change uh, proceeds. Blanket bog has, of course, been very heavily impacted over the last, um, uh, well, few centuries really by forestry, agriculture, and then most recently by atmospheric deposition. And it is um, one of our more vulnerable um, uh, peatland ecosystems in terms of uh, climate change. And just to show a picture here is actually a lowland blanket bog um, near uh, Tonner um, uh, just in the very southern limit really of Ronda Cannon, uh, Cannon Taff. So um, I'm going to repeat here the very first uh, picture I, I showed, a blanket bog. Uh, a, it's called blanket because of this blanketing mantle of peat, which, as you can see in this picture, is kind of following a nice, a nice almost sort of convex um, profile. And very often, it seems, these peatlands have developed um, in relation to uh, the development of um, a uh, podsalized uh, soil profiles and in particular iron pans at the uh, base of the mineral soil profile which then it impedes uh, the drainage of water and may have been quite significant in initiating the formation of peat um, but it's also the case that we've got blanket bogs that started their life as lakes and then developed through a swamp and fen phase into um, properly rain fed peat so we've got both types quite widespread in Wales. In, in terms of extent, it's the, it's the type of blanket peat that's developed directly on top of a mineral soil profile that we've got most of. And um, until relatively recently, one of, the, one of the big factors that was regarded as responsible for the widespread development of blanket bog was uh, human clearance of forest, prehistoric forest, going right back, in fact, to the Mesolithic. And um, to an extent, some of the um, basal ages of our blanket peats support this, with uh, this, this particular um, uh, uh, paper here, reckoning there's about a median age of basal blanket peat in Wales of 5,400 um, years old. And here's a little map showing just how Wales varies in terms of the age of the blanket peat. But more uh, recently, in particular, these authors um, have been keen to invoke climate change as, a, as a, probably at least equally important as a, as a causal agent of the origin of blanket bog. Uh, so quite a complicated set of factors uh, responsible for its formation there. And in its kind of what we understand really to be its, its near natural state, particularly in Wales, um, what we would regard perhaps as good quality blanket bog has a characteristic mix of uh, ericaceous species and cotton grass, particularly hare's tail cotton grass, um, with things like erica tetralix, cross leaved heath, uh, cranberry here in the bottom left, um, vaccinium vitis idea in the middle, and then empetrum nigrum on the right. And a really you know, good example of blanket bog vegetation will have a range of these things present, plus a good wadge of um, uh, uh, sphagnum that like these rain fed conditions and then other nice things like sundews and maybe even things like white beak uh, sedge. What we tend not to have so much in Wales is any degree of natural patterning and uh, the little insect picture on the top right is a schematic uh, from uh, one of the IUCN published resources on their website that shows uh, the kind of characteristic hummock hollow patterning of uh, rain fed peatlands and we've got very little of this naturally and in fact the, the image I'm showing here is is one where this micro topography has been artificially recreated by uh, systematic gully blocking 
uh, in this case up at uh, RSPB's Vernwy holding, uh, uh, and uh, particularly Kearney Eye, and thanks for Ale Alex from RSPB for this uh, image. And we don't really understand why uh, so few of our blanket buyers have any uh, natural patterning. It may well be past drainage and burning and overgrazing, but the causes of it aren't altogether, uh, altogether clear. What we do see uh, very widely in Wales is modification of the blanket bog habitat. So if one goes, uh, well, certainly in the Lost Peatlands area or uh, central Wales around the Elan Valley, uh, kind of purple moorgrass is king. Uh, and there is a kind of rough line we can draw on, uh, which shows uh, in red just where kind of millennia gets really preeminent. And uh, we reckon we got about 25,000 hectares of that. We know from paleoecological evidence that this is a relatively recent phenomenon. The causal agents aren't clear, but it's suspected to be uh, a combination of burning and past heavy grazing, quite possibly coupled with um, pollution from the Industrial Revolution era and then ongoing nitrogen deposition. But I suppose the key thing is that because we know it's a relatively recent origin rather than that they've always been like that, then we should be thinking about ways of encouraging a more kind of mixed uh, bog flora on these sites rather than just millennia. Uh, something we get particularly in the east of Wales is domination by heathers um, to pretty much the exclusion of anything else in this uh, picture and that's particularly where sites have a long history of burning but perhaps also on some of our drier peatlands and then in the far north um, in response really to, to very prolonged uh, heavy grazing, we get these uh, really floristically impoverished um, mires dominated by uh, by heathrush, and you know this is at an altitude of 850 um, or so. Uh, so this is we reckon we've got about 850 hectares of this, uh, and it's at around about eight to nine hundred uh, meters. So um, quite a challenge for restoration, really. And of course, then there's afforestation. The um, so really from uh, the earlier part of the last century onwards, uh, there was significant afforestation of Welsh blanket mires, uh, maybe as much as 9,000 hectares altogether. Um, interestingly, uh, and I mentioned earlier about the climatic vulnerability of blanket bog, um, where it's becoming fairly clear that the task of restoring uh, a forested peat or other forms of modified blanket bog back to semi-natural blanket bog is going to get harder. Uh, and this is a map produced um, by Gemma Bell under contract to Welsh Government, which uh, uh, sort of tries to summarise how hard that will get. So the more yellow the image goes uh, in the right hand side of the image, the harder it's going to be to restore blanket bog. And I'm picking out really three areas here. There's Mullith Hirifog in the north, there's parts of the Flandrian Mire plateau in kind of north mid Wales and then there's Radnor Forest towards the um, far east of Wales where if we don't get a move on we're going to find it very hard to restore blanket bog and in fact here is a picture of Radnor Forest from a week last Monday actually with my colleague uh, Rob Bacon from NRW and in this little pool you can see just how low the water table is that's a good 40 centimeters below ground level uh, so uh, plenty of scope for restoration there and I think the other thing that's going to get more and more challenging as time goes on is um, peat um, erosion this affects around about 180 odd sites in Wales uh, erosion complexes together account for just over 500 hectares and we reckon there's about 70 hectares in total of completely bare peat um, so with um, wetter winters and hotter, drier summers, and today's a good example of that, of course, uh, that, that resource is going to become ever more vulnerable to, uh, to erosion. Okay, so turning now to the kind of lowland uh, rain-fed peatlands and Wales and raised bog, and this is a, um, a photo of the magnificent course Fochno on the Dovey estuary, courtesy of uh, Mike, Mike Bailey. Uh, these uh, are 
characteristically form domes of uh, peat and the domes uh, develop as a result of the successional development of uh, accumulations of peat, often starting from a, an open water phase before proceeding through a fen peat phase. And then once peat gets above the level of the kind of surrounding groundwater table, they, they switch to full uh, rain fed growth mode and we get these lovely domes uh, of, of, of peat uh, with rainfall as the sole source really of rainfall and then with radial runoff um, either either side. And actually when I first came into this role in the late 90s we reckoned we only had about 20 or so of these whales but as um, we surveyed more and more sites through NRW's loan and peatman survey program we found more and we reckon that we've got about 50 odd of them all together uh, with only a relatively small number of really big ones uh, so uh, call, I don't know hopefully you can see my arrow moving course Fochno here uh, course Karen and then Fens of Wixall Mosses on the England Wales uh, border and when in good um, condition these characteristically have a very high cover of uh, sphagnum including lovely uh, uncommon things like this sphagnum magellanicum in this pick here and uh, bog rosemary of course um, but where modified uh, these will often uh, uh, develop a more impoverished flora with things like purple moorgrass um, being dominant uh, and this is just an aerial view of that of that patterning with uh, pools and, and and nice sphagnum hummocks. And our very best examples of raised bog will have areas of fen at the edge of the uh, peak dome where water runoff from the bog uh, kind of accumulates. And um, this this will have um, all sorts of lovely things like marsh synchrofoil and and uh, um, uh, un uncommon sedges as well. But all too often, this nice transition zone has been truncated uh, and um, kind of squeezed into being little more than a ditch, as shown here in this right-hand image for cause uh, for cause Karen. And this is really due to the loss of peripheral uh, peatland habitat over time. And to kind of illustrate this, this is a aerial photo of course Fochno in Keridigian with the red line being the protected site boundary and the yellow area actually showing the distribution of peat which uh, underpins that raised bog habitat so you know essentially uh, all semi-natural peatland vegetation pretty much has been lost from this wider peatland area and we're left with these very sharp truncated boundaries sometimes in this uh, inset image here uh, caused by peripheral peat cutting or by deep peripheral drainage. And of course, in some cases, we've actually lost the whole site. Uh, so there are uh, shadows of lowland raised bog across the Welsh landscape. And one of the very famous ones is uh, Ivaunog up near Dinas Mouthway, uh, where um, a writer over a century ago um, attests to the practice of, of really um, quite significant intense peat cutting to a point where it's cut away down to what's described here as the hard earth and that's gone altogether and um, I think we probably lost quite a few sites this way we don't have a good estimate but there were certainly uh, raised bog sites described on the northern side of the Mauvach estuary where there are now none and of course in uh, pre-railway uh, enabled Wales, what were people in rural communities to do? They were going to obviously exploit peat resources as a source of fuel and it was exploited very intensively. But fortunately, this more or less fizzled out after the Second World War and we largely escaped industrialised mechanised peat cutting although uh, Fens and Wixall Mosses was an exception to this. This is on the uh, Wrexham Shropshire border. This is a photo of the site not very long after its acquisition by Natural England, which shows uh, this remarkable patterning caused by block cutting for peat. And really, thankfully, we've missed um, the, the kind of super destructive surface milling uh, method of peat harvesting from sites for horticultural peat. This is a picture of a site in Lancashire just a few years ago. And uh, luckily, this this never got this this practice never got to got to Wales, but it's it's still alive and well. And um, and of course, there's still quite a lot of hand cutting going on in various bits of the 
uh, of, of the, uh, the British Isles, including uh, the Republic of Ireland, where um, the Irish government um, has at various times attempted to, uh, to, to ban um, hand cutting of peat. And there's an interesting, interesting news headline here from, from that time. Okay, so moving on to the kind of uh, the, the, the peatland end of the spectrum where uh, uh, rainfall isn't the only source of water, uh, where other sources of water are important. And in general terms, these are divided into topogenous and siliginous uh, fens. Topogenous are where uh, uh, the peat essentially accumulates in a, in a ground hollow and where the main plane of water movement is up and down. Uh, but then because we're a nice undulating uh, country with lots of uh, clay smeared landscapes from the last glaciation, we also get um, siliginous peatlands fed by the upslope supply of water as runoff. And we get all sorts of weird and wonderful kind of intermediates between these, uh, these two. Um, so some of the characteristics really of our more acid or poor fens, uh, it's a super uh, widespread and um, compendious group. There's all sorts of different vegetation types included in it. It includes remarkably bog-like vegetation, um, but uh, because the pH goes up to about five and a half, there's scope for lots of other things. And in fact, there's a more or less complete turnover of species from one end of the gradient um, to the other, and, and of course, a wide range of successional types. And it includes an annex one habitat, a habitat uh, recognised under the Habitats and Species Directive that NRW's recently uh, won a life project to uh, restore in Wales, which is very um, exciting news. And one of the reasons poor fens are so uh, widespread in Wales is that an awful lot of our geology uh, yields pretty um, acid or at best neutral uh, water. We're dominated by acid geology as opposed to limestone geology. Uh, and um, this is why poor fens are particularly widespread uh, in the blue kind of and green area on this on this map. So what does a poor typical poor fen look like? And my best analogy to this is to say, well, what does a typical dog look like? Uh, dogs vary all the way from Chihuahuas to St Bernard's. Uh, and uh, poor fens are no different. Uh, there's a really wide spectrum of types. And the easiest way I can think of uh, summarising it is, is again on, on two axes. One is age, the other is the degree of this flushing influence from uh, upslope irrigation. Uh, and we go all the way from the really, really bog-like uh, poor fens that the vegetate their vegetation shows a strong overlap with rain fed peatlands uh, all the way through um, to uh, uh, types of peatland with lots of uh, sedges and um, other plants that you wouldn't necessarily get on a, on a rain fed uh, peatland. Uh, so here is a typical uh, poor fen with uh, bog bean, uh, cross leaf teeth, uh, it's got a bit of bottle sedge. It's got some of the more um, mineral demanding sphagna as well. Nice, rich uh, kind of flora, things like bog bean, common cotton grass uh, as well. And these very often form uh, from open water precursors as a rafting um, succession. And you then get a kind of precarious, squidgy sort of surface that you can walk across, hence the name quaking, quaking bog or quaking uh, mire. And a cross section through these will often show really quite a thin raft of uh, sedge rhizomes and poorly consolidated peat. And uh, you can scare yourself silly on these places by walking right out into the middle and shoving a walking pole in. And you kind of suddenly find there's absolutely nothing under the walking pole. You're on, you're literally on a thin, it's like walking on a lilo really over water. There's not much, uh, there's not much there. Uh, and all sorts of different sedges uh, contribute to forming um, these peatlands uh, with uh, uh, common cotton grass, particularly widespread as in this as in this picture. The bog fen, uh, the bog light poor fens, as I say, look remarkably bog like with hare's tail cotton grass, but will usually have uh, the more mineralotrophic sphagna present as well. And this particular example has got a lovely clump of royal fern uh, right in the middle of it. A uh, very rich uh, range of component plant communities, um, so all sorts of different plant communities from the British National Vegetation Classification, including um, uh, quite a 
big group of um, plant communities which we recognised during our peatland survey, which weren't actually in the NVC. Uh, so things uh, with a lot of sphagnum phallax and vaccinium oxycoccus that were just not quite covered by the NVC uh, scheme. So where have all these poor fens come from? And we think quite a lot probably owe their origin to historic peat cutting and then the uh, subsequent development of um, uh, uh, poor fen vegetation over the over the top. And a typical profile through one of these poor fens often looks a bit like this. So you've got a, a, a up to 60 centimeter layer of sphagnum peat and rhizomes, then uh, a lens of water, and then uh, a very different type of peat underneath which is pretty well decomposed pretty dry and pretty oxidized looking at the top and the suspicion um is that um you know these were uh, uh, owe their origin at some point to uh, to peat cutting so an interesting interesting story then and then uh, a very varied suite of the siliginous pore fans uh this is one of the richer ones at in Cravenant in north Wales where water movement is occurring through these runnels and where we've got nice things like marsh, St John's wort and bog, uh, bog pondweed. So I hope that's given some impression of just the sheer variety of our of our poor, uh, poor fen resource. And then moving uh, to the kind of rich fen resource, the ones that are fed by calcium rich uh, water, these usually occur on limestone geology or uh, calcium enriched drift and fantastically species rich, right up to about 40 to 45 species per square meter. Uh, and in North Wales in particular, we've got this particular type of um, alkaline fen uh, for which uh, this plant black bog rush is um, is very important and you can see from its distribution map that there's a real center of distribution for this around Anglesey and Clean as opposed to uh, the other kind of UK stronghold in uh, East Anglia and all sorts of uh, kind of gorgeous uncommon plants associated with these like fly orchid, long bracted yellow sedge, grass of uh, Parnassus and uh, flea sedge so very very floristically uh, rich. And then kind of finally, um, our tall herb um, fens, which we get quite widely on our uh, uh, larger, uh, particularly west facing river valleys and in grazing marsh contexts. And through the Lowland Peatland Survey, we've surveyed uh, quite a few of these. I haven't surveyed all of them. Uh, so the ones in red are notable emissions, but the green ones um, all have this nice uh, Oops, just go back a minute. Sorry, combination of uh, uh, common reed, tall herbs, and then uh, taller kind of sedges underneath. So, quite rich places. And then, kind of no description really of uh, Welsh peatlands would be talking would be complete uh, without talking a little bit about um, the very wide range of of woody plant communities that we get on these, going all the way from. Uh, kind of forms of bog woodland really in the bottom right through to uh, more nutrient rich uh, fen car ecosystems in the top left and my colleague uh, Jim Latham in NRW has uh, has uh, tried to review the, the kind of range of wet woodlands and there's a, a hugely diverse extent. Okay so just to talk a little bit really about where we kind of where we go next and um, it's useful to start with this with just a little review really of the current state of our Welsh uh, peatlands and in broad terms we can think of this as three thirds uh, so around about a third of our of our peatland resources of what we might regard as a near natural peatland by no means or is all of this in good uh, condition quite a lot of this is um, is in need of, of, of uh, some sort of uh, restorative management and ongoing management, but that's around about a third. A bit more than a third is our is our kind of modified semi-natural peatland where there's definitely a need for restoration effort. And then another third is uh, non-peat forming uh, uh, habitat sitting on top of peat, uh, which includes extensive grassland, uh, that's grassland that's not getting a lot of applied nutrients intensive grassland and forestry and in terms of um, condition we reckon based on the last um, article 17 re reporting round that only around about 5600 hectares is in is in good um, 
condition, a big wadge of it is poor, and an even bigger wadge of it is unassessed. Uh, so this is the this is the condition of the semi-natural peat resource. So we've got a big, big job ahead of us. And um, uh, at, at the moment, the main contributory factors uh, based on this are listed here. Um, so uh, atmospheric deposition is um, a biggie. We still need to do a lot to get our grazing regimes into a state which is kind of supportive, fully supportive of peatland function. Lots of nutrient enrichment, still lots of ongoing drainage uh, and kind of so on. So lots of factors that we need to um, we need to address. And kind of in addition to the biodiversity argument for restoring peatlands, there is now a huge importance attached to the role of peatlands in um, in mitigating uh, climate change through the um, function that peatlands have in regulating the emissions of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. And it is the case that it's only really peatlands in good condition that are net sinks and that as modification of peatland surfaces increases, then the greenhouse gas emissions from those peatland surfaces increase. So really it's only peatland with a semi-natural vegetation cover in good condition that's going to be delivering the full range of ecosystem services we associate with um, with peatland with peatland uh, sites and it is the case that peatlands are our biggest carbon store uh, that it's only the healthy ones that actually sequester uh, greenhouse gases it's the degraded ones that emit it to varying degrees and land management's the overriding control of whether these peatlands are net sinks or net uh, sources and so this um, together with the biodiversity argument has spawned a huge uh, amount of restoration activity this was kind of ticking along small scale really up until the turn of the century up until about 2000 and then a whole bunch of life projects got going. Uh, initially, RSPB's project on the on the Vernwy estate in North Wales, and then um, CCW ran one on the rich fens of North Wales, and so on, culminating really in the Lost Peatlands programme. And then in 2020, um, we, uh, through discussion with Welsh government, launched uh, our new national peatland action programme. This is driven by the need to restore peatlands in response to both the nature and climate change emergency and has been enabled with additional uh, grant and aid from Welsh Government. It's supported by a huge raft of uh, policy uh, now, so uh, net, the Net Zero Wales Carbon Budget 2 uh, mentions the need to set up this, um, this peat programme and we've got six priority action themes where we're going to focus effort uh, ranging from uh, dealing with erosion uh, right through to our most heavily modified peatlands and of course forested peatlands uh, are here which is a, a key feature of the lost peatlands program but we're also trying to uh, get going on three major cross-cutting themes to improve our coordination of of activity of effort of monitoring and and also to uh, you know increase the range of partners engaged in um, in peatland restoration. So as I, as I just come to the end of my um, slot here, kind of what are the key challenges and opportunities as we go forward? And I think one has to say, you know, the sheer extent of degradation uh, is a big challenge. But if we all, you know, work together, we've got the tools and the techniques uh, to be able to do this. And uh, government is uh, helping very significantly with the resources uh, side. We definitely want to integrate the work we're doing with uh, payment for ecosystem services opportunities, notably the Peatland Code and the Emerging Sustainable Farming Scheme. And we want to greatly increase the capacity and capability of our land manager and contractor sector. There is now so much peatland restoration going on, we haven't got enough people to actually um, deliver it. And of course, we're very keen to create a pipeline of future projects. And to this end, uh, this year, we launched a, a grant specifically to support the development of uh, shovel ready um, projects. And then finally, as we go on really with with peatland restoration, we're really keen to start um, achieving some traction with our most very most heavily modified peatlands. And it's interesting that this doesn't necessarily have to involve land use change. So a recent um, paper led by uh, 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 staff from CEH 
uh, reckons that in certain deep drained lowland peatlands, even if you only raise the water table by 10 centimetres, that can actually uh, result in a significant reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. So what we're looking at effectively is a whole tiered range of um, of potential interventions that could be used to reduce emissions from some of our most very heavily uh, modified peatlands. Anyway, I've, t I've talked for way too long probably, so thank you very much for your attention and uh, do get in touch if we can provide any further information. That was great, Pete, thank you. Um, we're going to do a bit of a run through of um, some lost peatland stuff now, but if anyone has any questions about anything that Pete spoke about during that presentation, um, if you want to put it in the chat, we'll uh, go through anything that comes up at the end. I'm hoping that you can now see uh, the screen that I've shared. Um, can you just see the, the slides or can you see everything um, around it as well? Uh, someone just give me a thumbs up or a, or a yes. You're right, Jerry. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah, um, so I'm going to give a bit of a run through of um, Lost Peatlands uh, today and kind of our progress to date and um, plans for the future, uh, restoration wise and, and monitoring wise. Um, and there is kind of a bit of a background introduction to a couple of specific peatland sites in the, in the valleys. Uh, and their origin and, and importance as well. Um, so for anyone who's not familiar with the Lost Peatlands project uh, so far, we are an HLF funded project and we've had a kind of a one year development phase and we're now into our delivery phase where we actually get to do all of the exciting work that we've planned um, kind of running up until uh, 2025. Um, we're focused on peatland restoration, but we do have a lot of other sites which are kind of community gateway sites, um, which are peatland habitats as well. This is kind of the broad layout of our um, sites across the valleys that cover sites in um, Neath Patalba and uh, Rondekin and Taft, so it's the Avon and, and Ronda valleys. Um, our peatland upland habitat restoration areas are uh, Cregan HRA, Cumcybrid HRA and, and Castel Loss HRA that you can see in blue there. Um, with our kind of wider community sites of, of different habitats uh, in the kind of orange uh, hatch. Um, we are uh, match funded by works that are happening on the Penicum with wind farm. Um, and that's kind of split into, into four large areas that you can see um, kind of spreading across the whole of the upland platter. Uh, Pete's already given us a really good um, kind of background on peat formation, so I don't uh, need to go into that too much, but um, looking at kind of specific examples within our South Wales uplands, within the, the project area. Um, there are sites uh, in Kumparkin and Craig Flynn where there have been uh, peat cores, uh, which is done, and then that kind of allows for accurate species identification of the pollen within the peat and the, the ratio of the species, as well as kind of the bulk amount of pollen, uh, and then being able to use methods such as radiocarbon dating kind of allow us to get quite a detailed picture of what the history of these sites could have looked like. Uh, so the entire South Wales region underwent kind of glaciation about 18,000 years ago, and then they retreated um, away from us sort of between 10 and 12,000 years ago. Um, the Carmarthen, Fens and Brecon Beacons were sort of the principal glacial collecting point uh, close to us and the northern uh, face of those are the source of a lot of uh, Corrie glaciers. Um, Crygar Flynn and the Pennine, uh, Pennine Sandstone Escarpment uh, was kind of the only uh, barrier to deflect the main kind of ice flow um, away from us and it created an ice cap of its own. It was the force of the ice flowing down through the valleys which created a lot of the kind of typical glaciers um, that we can still see if you walk through the landscape today. Uh, so the historic evidence that we have of this landscape goes back to sort of the, the Mesolithic era and the earliest evidence of human settlement in the Ronda comes from about, well, it's a wide range, but it's 10,000 to 4,500 uh, BC. Uh, and there's a wide range of kind of archaeological finds that we've had with um, flints and blades and, and scrapers and, and microliths associated with charcoal, which uh, were brought up during the peak cores. Um, 
in recent geological time, um, we had kind of a progression through tundra vegetation and then through uh, birch and pine woodland. Uh, and then about eight and a half thousand years ago, we had to kind of a move into the boreal um, landscape, which was dominated by oak, elm and hazel. Um, the bog formation that we uh, have evidence for in the peak cores is after the extent of the ice flow in the South Wales Valley, so about 10,000 years ago. Um, and a, a more recent development uh, than in other areas, and it's seen um, as likely to be a result of combination of human impacts through tree felling combined with a shift towards uh, kind of more oceanic conditions and the overall climate. Uh, initially, peak formation, um, as, as peak kind of went through, would have been confined to shallow lakes and wet hollows, but the majority of the peak that we deal with within the project area is um, a blanket peak um, with quite a few uh, kind of poor fen, acid fen areas as well. Um, one thing that we have found within the project area that was very exciting during the construction of the Mardi wind farm um, is a 6,000 year old oak post, which is decorated uh, by kind of oval patterns and, and zigzags all across it. And it's the earliest piece of decorative wood carving found in Europe um, at the time. Uh, it's believed to be the boundary of something significant, but uh, yeah, details are a bit thin on the ground. The landscape that we're dealing with was uh, too wet for crops. So people historically used these hills for uh, pasture and there's a network of old walls and enclosures beneath the forestry um, that kind of draped across the entirety of our project area. Um, there was some modification to the peatlands because of the uh, grazing, uh, but it did maintain the, the sort of heathland acid grassland mosaic across a lot of the upland areas. Um, and then from the late 18th century onwards, there's a lot of poets and artists who uh, <laughs> visited the unspoilt valleys of Glamorgan and um, in his, there's a book from 1804, which describes this landscape as the Alps of Glamorgan, which is uh, something that we, um, yeah, we, we enjoy saying. Um, the Industrial Revolution had less of an impact on the upland plateau than in uh, the valleys than in other areas. There is still um, uh, an amount of nitrogen and, and sulfur deposition from the thousands of coal burning um, chimneys. But uh, the massive change that followed the Second World War was a transition from kind of open pasture land through into a more forestry kind of dominated landscape. Um, so in the 50s and 60s, uh, a lot of this upland landscape was planted with commercial conifers. The first tree went in um, called Morganic in the Avon Valley in, in 1921. So we've had in the oldest areas um, in, in our project area, just over, over 100 years of um, commercial tree use, which lead, has led to kind of a continuous um, coop cover of, of Sitka spruce uh, that we see now. Uh, and then more recent kind of land use changes. In the 2000s, uh, there's a technical advice note produced by the Welsh Government for wind farms, and it identified the Lost Peatlands landscape as somewhere suitable for major wind farm development. Um, so what we see now across a lot of the areas is um, wind farm construction and uh, operation. Um, so this is an aerial view of um, Penicumwith Wind Farm. Um, which is the one, the main um, wind farm which we work with within the Lost Peatlands project area. And you can see the, the kind of patchwork mosaic of open areas and, and, and standing crop, um, as well as some, some felled areas. There are 76 turbines on this wind farm, so it, it supplies about 15% of the electrical electricity needs of, of Wales. Um, and you can see, the changes in the landscape that we're going to see once we take these trees off and move back towards more of a, an open habitat system. So in terms of you know why do we have forestry on peatland in, within the Lost Peatlands kind of project area? Um, post World War II, a lot of the uh, peat in Wales was forested to replenish the areas deforested during the war effort and this led um, the broad scale loss of woodland cover led to a lot of policies and interventions, um, grants or tax breaks at the government level to increase woodland cover across the UK. 
Um, in our project area, this included widespread land purchased by the then Forestry Commission from local landowners um, and conversion from what would have been low intensity agricultural grazing land to uh, forestry land. Um, the kind of mass increase in conifer cover across the valleys was helped by uh, more recent innovations in plow technology as well. A lot of these sites had similar initial preparation um, across the valleys with a double mold board plow. Uh, and there was a, a great set of experimental work that was done by Forestry Commission Wales, um, I think published um, in the 90s, looking at the um, performance of conifer crops on peatlands in Wales. And it has a great record of the initial site preparations um, just after purchase. So this is an aerial view of uh, Cumcyber and HRA, one of our upland peat sites, and you can see the kind of intensive ploughing network that, that needed to happen for, for these um, trees to be established. Um, most of the, the site preparation was done with a double mold board plough and then the, the trees were planted in uh, the ridges that were created by that, that ploughing motion. And then there's cross cutting drains which take the water away off site. Um, the effects of afforestation on peat um, the hydrological re um, effects is kind of a drawdown of the water table within the peat, and then the evapotranspiration of the crop and hydrological interception through the canopy closing uh, dramatically reduces the amount of water reaching the bog surface, sometimes up to 40%. So when we get a lower water table um, in the peat, there is also an increased oxidation of the peat, as well as uh, the kind of generalised surface drying that you see over much of the site. Morphologically, you get a lot of surface peat loss through erosion. Um, and we have seen in some cases, the drainage features expanding um, through erosion uh, as the water comes out of the crop. And this leads to a much higher level of um, dissolved organic carbon runoff through the drainage systems. And the compression of the substrate, so the peat body itself, as the trees get higher, um, uh, increases over time as the trees get taller and, and heavier. And we've also seen kind of a broad scale change to the ecological balance of these sites. This um, aerial shows a lot of millennia dominated areas and the specialist biodiversity, the really peak forming species and, and typical Maya species that you would expect to see, hope to see, uh, become limited to the areas which are sort of the flattest and wettest on site, uh, which tends to be in some cases the, the drains. Um, one question that does always get brought up with our project is, is the carbon balance between um, the commercial conifer crop and the existing peatland resource, um, because sometimes uh, it can lead to kind of conflicting policy targets when you have um, um, hopes to massively increase tree cover, but also uh, fund widespread uh, peat restoration. Um, while they're actively growing plantations can contribute to massive carbon sequestration, the loss in carbon from the alteration to the deep peat can sometimes outweigh the benefits. So we had some figures from the IUCN, um, which highlighted the chain, changes um, in carbon storage potential between the afforested peat and bog habitat. Um, and they kind of came to the conclusion that a functional 20 centimeter thick layer of sagnum contains the same amount of carbon as a 60 year old lodgepole pine coop, which has been growing on the deep peat for 60 years. Um, one thing that often doesn't get taken into account in some uh, landscape scale carbon emission uh, calculations is the ultimate fate of the project, uh, of the product, which also has an effect on the, on the carbon budget. Um, so the ideal situation for timber would be a long term store, mid to long term store. So if you use something in, in um, construction, um, it adds to the carbon balance based on the corresponding drop in the use of other materials. Um, but if something is used for wood fuel, um, if it gets chipped and burnt, to generate energy. That's um, meaning that the carbon that was stored in the trees is then released into the atmosphere in a relatively short time. So the main restoration interventions that we're progressing during the project are to raise the water table of the peat body. Um, you saw how intensively drained they were and the, the hydrological intervention is seen as our first kind of key barrier to overcome. Um, there are a variety of methods to, to do that. I'll go through a couple of them in a minute, but the um, main benefits that we're hoping to get from this work is uh, a reduced amount of erosion and, and carbon loss from the habitat as it is now, 
um, as well as the creation of priority uh, habitat, a kind of ecological, um, ecologically significant habitat within uh, the project area. Um, we're also kind of having benefits on, on water quality as well, um, as well as helping to reduce flood and wildfire risk, um, as well as kind of socio-economic benefits of the project as a whole. There's been a lot of investment in deprived communities um, through, the, through the Lost Peakness project and the HLF funding that we've had. So this um, is an example of a drain running under a coop. Um, you can just see my colleague Mike's leg there in the top right, top left hand corner for scale. Um, so once the peat has been restored to kind of a less degraded condition, we're hoping that uh, the local Maya uh, vegetation communities uh, will come in and recolonize and we'll get back to a more functional system. We will be doing some sphagnum planting uh, throughout the duration of the project as well to kind of give things a bit of a kickstart. This video shows uh, an example of ground smoothing at Panic Um I'm not sure it's going to run, but we'll provide a link at the end if it doesn't want to. Um, so the prime aim of the ecological hydro, eco-hydrological restoration for us is to try and restore uh, near natural soil water levels within the peat body. So that means we want to have the water table higher and more stable throughout the year. Um, we're a type of forest to bog restoration project and a forested restoration um, of peatland is still an emerging area of research, but broadly the methods consist of removing the micro topography created by the plowing and draining uh, through ground smoothing, which is kind of mechanical reprofiling to create a level surface. Uh, in this example, the stumps were that were left over post felling were picked up by the digger uh, flipped around and then the digger drove across uh, the stumps to kind of crush them into the peat. Uh, this has kind of the double effect of uh, compacting the surface uh, so the water can't move through the degraded soil um, as easily and also leveling off the uh, micro topography um, and blocking the ditches. Um, we had a lot of uh, consultation for this project, so as well as our own surveys, which were very intensive, we uh, looked at other examples of peatland restoration projects all across the UK um, and did a big deep dive into existing best practice. Um, the lost peatland sites do have some challenges in that the peat resource itself is often shallower and differently degraded because of the very changeable land use history that we've had. Um, and there are some ecological and archaeological risks which we've had mit to mitigate for um, during the planning of the works. And success for us um, is, is um, going to be measured primarily through the monitoring of soil water levels um, because of the duration of the project. That's the thing that we can most accurately and reasonably measure um, within the relatively short time frame. Um, and the monitoring, which I'll cover briefly at the end, is being um, covered by kind of core site staff, but we have an existing relationship with Swansea University, which is kind of delivering medium to long-term monitoring as well. Uh, some examples of what restoration can look like. Um, this is on the left, um, a plastic dam, which was put in a drainage channel um, on Cores Fochno. Uh, and then on the right are some timber dams, which were put in uh, on the winter of 2019 on uh, Millith Mine Common, which is a, a small area of peatland near uh, Cambran. And they're both holding back water uh, pretty well in these pictures. Uh, this aerial image came uh, to us from NRW. It's just outside our project area, uh, but still within the same kind of upland valleys landscape. And this is uh, an example of low elevation contour bending. Uh, so you can see the water being held upslope um, towards the, the bottom of the picture here. Um, but one issue that was raised as a result of these works was that it didn't do as much to kind of lessen the um, micro topography left from the ploughing. Um, so one way to get rid of that micro topography completely is ground smoothing. Um, so originally this site would have looked like that aerial that you would have just seen 
uh, and this is kind of showing a, an immediately after the works and then, and then 10 years post works example. Um, so the, the, the picture on the left is from Pentacom with wind farm. Um, and then the picture on the right is from uh, Whiteley Wind Farm in Scotland. For our restoration design, we've got to kind of um, fulfill two distinct aims. So we have to provide a suitable evidence base for us to design and cost all the restoration uh, proposals, but we also need to have enough baseline data to allow for post restoration uh, kind of measurement of success. Um, so for us, the um, measure of success is focused on what we can reasonably expect to show some um, changes to within the lifetime of the project. Um, so we have ecological monitoring and hydrological monitoring as, as core monitoring outcomes for um, lost peatland staff within the project. And then we also have um, a lot of additional monitoring going on with the university. So for us to figure out the peat depth and target the restorations on our site, um, we did peat probing on, on 100 meter grid. And one of the key lessons we learned uh, was that these aforested peat systems were dealing with a, a really variable in their peat distribution. All of our study sites, study sites uh, show really significant historic erosion features that have led to really sharp changes in, in some cases over really small distances. Uh, and while they're kind of largely stable at their present because uh, they're vegetated up quite well, um, there is a risk that when we go in and do the work, we can um, have some negative effects. The sharp changes in peak depth are also kind of poorly modeled by our um, some kind of spatial modeling of, of peak depth data. So we've had to use multiple data sources to kind of um, identify the peak body boundaries and appropriate restoration treatments. Um, this is one of the large erosion features on one of our sites here. And you can see the cross-cutting drains uh, very well in the LIDAR, as well as some of the Rizin Farrow uh, plough, which is a bit harder to see. Um, high resolution light, so that's a cross-cutting drain there, just on the edge of an, um, an erosion feature. And the high resolution LIDAR has been incredibly useful for us um, to plan out all of our works. So we've had a number of sites which have been identified with deep peat resources. Um, and these are our HRAs in, uh, within our project. So the maps on the left show the peak depth of one of our sites where we've had some restoration work done. And then the map on the right um, shows the topographical slope analysis from the LIDAR. Uh, we also had ecological and hydrological baseline surveys uh, to set out the baseline before we went and did any work. Uh, and the ecological surveys allowed us to generate habitat maps which show different land types and habitat conditions. Um, and this has informed the restoration techniques that we've proposed for each site. Um, the differences in baseline condition, peak depth um, and slope allow us to kind of create a tailored mosaic of interventions, which is what you see on this map here. The detailed peak depth that we ended up with after all the surveys allowed us to do some uh, peak calculations for uh, carbon storage. Um, so without intervention, this resource is going to continue to oxidize and erode. Um, but with intervention, uh, we're hoping to lock in the carbon that we've got stored here already um, and then create the right conditions uh, for peatland vegetation to come in and hopefully uh, get it back to a functioning ecosystem in, in the medium to long term. The lost peatland sites across the project area store about 350,000 tonnes of carbon, um, which is the equivalent to more than 5 million trees grown for 10 years. So this is one thing that we've done so far. Uh, last winter, we managed to get some work done on Castle Noss over by Mardi. Um, it was a combination of uh, ground smoothing and, and cross tracking. So there were some small areas of, of stump flipping and crushing into the peat. And then the majority of what you can see here um, was achieved by uh, cross-tracking with a machine, which is just driving perpendicular to the direction of the plough lines to try and crush down the microtopography um, and um, compact the peak so the water can't flow through it as much. And then we blocked all of the plough lines and ditches at, at uh, regular intervals, increasing where the slope was higher. Um, and you can see them holding back water very well. Um, we were very pleased with the work that was done this winter, I was up there um, 
last week and the, the water level, despite the warm weather that we've had, was, was much higher to the surface than what we had uh, before the works were done. Uh, going forward, there is still work to be done at this site. So there's some heavily eroded channels, which are going to need some reprofiling uh, and some heavier dams uh, put in because the regular peak dams, which we used across most of the site, won't have the kind of integrity that we need. Um, so it would either be a use of live willow dams um, or um, heavy timber dams. This is a timeline of, of what we're, we're hoping to have over the next few years. So you can see the work on the north and west side of, of Castel Noss over at the right of the map, which is what was done uh, last winter. Um, this winter, we're focusing on our site over in the Avon Valley, uh, Cregan, which is going to be a, a slightly different starting um, situation. Uh, there'll be more uh, woody material for us to deal with there. So we'll focus more on uh, stump flipping and um, stump removal than just crashing the peat with the, the digger. Uh, and then comes Ibrin as well, which is a smaller uh, pocket of peat, but using a similar methodology to, to Cregan, much of it. I spoke briefly about monitoring, and this is a, a map that we've, we've shown a few times, and it, it doesn't need some updating uh, now because we've got some extra work going on over the summer, but it shows kind of the level of, of monitoring that we're having um, across our peatland areas. So we're gonna have a mix of uh, two by two meter and 10 by 10 meter vegetation quadrats, as well as um, continuous automatic water level uh, readings taken from dip wells. Uh, we've got at least five per site, kind of up to 15, as well as on one of our sites, um, a rain gauge and V-notch weir. Uh, we've got barrel loggers to measure the atmospheric pressure and we've had heavy metal cores done to kind of quantify the uh, heavy metal content of the peak. Um, this summer we went out and, and started doing a, a bit more of a camera trap campaign to look for um, mammal distribution across the sites. Um, and then we have our permanent monitoring plots for where we have a uh, sphagnum inoculation, um, which we're going to be doing on Lost Peatland sites over the coming years. And we had a trial area for sphagnum inoculation on the wind farm. Um, we've also got, starting this summer, um, some modelling work and some on the ground uh, ground truthing surveys for conifer regen and peat, which is kind of a, a big deal for us, um, looking at both um, seed throw and the percentage of the conifers which survive the restoration works, uh, as well as some more intensive vegetation surveys, um, greenhouse gas collars being installed, and then um, we have someone working with us, but not as part of the Lost Peatlands project within the same landscape. Uh, looking at using different geophysical techniques uh, like ground penetrating radar uh, for measuring peak depth. Um, so yeah, thank you for listening. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen now. If anyone has any questions about anything we've covered, please uh, let us know. I think we got, we just to say, Joey, we got uh, a hand up from Melissa. Oh, okay, yeah. I think you're on mute at the moment, Melissa, if you do want to ask a question. I think this means we've done a good job, Pete. There's uh, no questions coming through. Well, uh, well, yeah, yeah. And thank you for your talk. That was very interesting. Um, if anyone does have any questions, we'll uh, send around um, a link to this webinar once we put it up on uh, the Neath Potava Council YouTube. But um, yeah, thanks everyone for attending. Um, and if you do think of anything that you'd like to ask, please do get in contact with us and we'll, we'll do the best to answer your questions. Um, can, Melissa, can Melissa ask her question in the chat? 
Yeah, she yeah, can't unmute um, her phone. Yeah, if anyone can't unmute themselves, um, if you want to put it in the chat, that's fine. Well, uh, if anybody's typing, it may as well just come in. We've got um, a bog day uh, on, well, it's International Bog Day this Sunday on the 24th. So if you'd like to see peatlands for yourself, we're uh, doing a guided walk around Pennacombe Oak Wind Farm where there's been restoration uh, ongoing for some years now. So we can give an introdu introduction to that site, uh, guided walk that Sunday at seven o'clock. I put the link in the chat box here, or you'll find it elsewhere on our website, um, social media. Um, and I think also as well, if you want to see Michael, Becky on the news tonight, they might be on ITV at six o'clock. So keep an eye out for that. I think it's ITV Wales. Um, but yeah, as far as I'm aware, uh, they should be appearing there and there'll be a sort of mini story of the, the work that we've been doing up at Castell North that Joey was talking about. But yeah, thanks again for everyone to come in. Yeah, thanks, Pete. It's a very uh, interesting presentation from yourself and Jerry. So yeah, thanks for all. Uh, you're most welcome. Yeah. Oh, there is a uh, Melissa. We have questions come through. Uh, so Melissa, your question is just to ask: Is there any protection in place for degraded peatland on farmland? E.g., farmland to protect against building, etc. Uh, I think that's a that's a really um, good question. I mean, peatland or other peat per se, uh, once you're outside kind of statutory uh, protected sites, um, doesn't have any protection as such. I mean, it's 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 protected under mineral planning uh, guidelines uh, from for extraction for you know for for the use of peat. There's also quite a it's quite a strong raft of uh, government policy. There's um, planning policy Wales, uh, you know, kind of does does uh, you know you know there's a strong steer there to avoid areas of of peat or to avoid damaged areas of peat. And there's also the um, EIA regulations that cover cover peatland. Uh, so you know it is fairly well fairly well covered but there isn't any statutory protection as such for uh for for for, for pete in the specific case you are asking i think Okay, cool. I think um, unless anyone has anything else that they want to jump in with, we'll uh, end it there. Um, seven minutes or so uh, before the planned end of the session. Anyway, um, so thanks everyone for coming. Thanks, Pete, for your presentation. It was uh, it was great. Uh, you're um, most welcome. Yeah. Yeah. So nice to see everyone, and uh, keep an eye out for uh, other events that we've got. Yeah. Um, nice to see you all. Okay, thanks all. Thanks, Pete. Thanks all. Yep. Okay, take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Uh, cheers, Jerry. Thanks, Richard.